the analytics that I'm watching this year here, and we'll kind of go through it. These are the advanced stats for those who are, who are joining us here for the first time. So three-point frequency, percentage of shots you're taking from beyond the arc, how many shots you're assisting, assist to field goal percentage, transition offense, and then the last one, free throw rate. So Matt, I want to get your take here. You see the first three categories already seeing some improvement from last season. The free throw rate category is going down, and I expect that probably will be the case as we go through the course of the season based on the way that the Spurs play. But I want to get your take. What do you what do you see as being key out of those four analytics that are going to be important for the Spurs this year? Yeah, I mean, I agree. let's take the free throws out of it. I think that'll change. It's a small sample size. But the other three are kind of in line with what we've seen, what we what Coach Pop has been talking about this season. That's pushing the pace. They're they're fast break and transition points are up uh, shooting more threes, right? They, they added a couple more shooters, Bryn Forbes, Doug McDermott, some of those younger guys getting more confidence and experience to let it fly a little more so that they got that going for them as well, which is nice. And then uh, the last one, the, the assist percentage, they're playing together. They're sharing the basketball. They're, they're driving, they're kicking the ball's not sticking. There's not a lot of one-on-one -on -one basketball, which just means more of their field goals are assisted which is what, what you like to see based on the personnel they have on their team without really having uh, one of those go-to isolation guys that you can just throw the ball to and say, go make a play. And I think, again, you know, those are the things that, look, offensively for the Spurs early in the season, they're averaging 112 points. Their offensive rating is top 10 through the first four games. And my belief is because of those three things, because they're taking more threes, because their assist to field goal percentage is higher, and because they're getting out in transition. You assume they finish, you know, in the top third of the league in those three categories. Offensively, they're going to be just fine, despite the fact that they may not have a superstar on their roster. Yeah, especially because when you play with that style, it, you can't. it's hard to game prep for that. You know, normally when you're playing a team like tonight, look at the Spurs playing Dallas. They're like, all right, Luka Doncic is the clear-cut head of the snake. He's going to have the ball in his hands a lot. He's going to be initiating the offense the majority of the time. And you can prepare for that. You can put in some schemes, some different coverages to try to discourage that. With these guys, with, with it could be anyone shooting or anyone having a night on any given night or uh, – all the all the sharing the basketball, not a lot of isolation. That's hard to prepare for and scheme for on the other team because everybody's playing together. And, and no matter what you throw, just organically, their offensive style of play is going to naturally find uh, the open shots. So I like that. I like it in that regard in the long term. Well, Matt, the Spurs, we mentioned the free throw rate note there at the bottom. The Spurs are only averaging 15 free throws a game. But in fact, as a league, the NBA Teams are only averaging 20 free throws, which would be a low, an uh, all-time low if that number were to stay. Here is what we're seeing on, and I thought this was interesting from an early season standpoint. These are high-volume shooters. Look at the difference in shooting fouls drawn from last season to this season for just these five guys. And Matt, if you don't know, and if our fans don't know, the NBA decided to put a point of emphasis on perimeter shooting fouls, abnormal shots, not in the realm of play per se in terms of the officials calling things differently. It seems to have made an impact at least early on into drawing those perimeter fouls that we often see some players use to get to the line. Absolutely. And first of all, fantastic work, Dan. That is an awesome stat. And really, like, you look to change 7%. But, it, but if you're going like from 14% to 7%, it's like half as many free throws for these guys, which is a huge difference. And I love it. It's not, I'm a big spirit of the game type of guy, right? And, and I feel like trying to trick the refs and draw foul, cheap fouls, shooting threes like that is not in the spirit of the game. I think it's bad for the game. And I'm glad they did something about it. Same thing with flopping. Remember years ago, everybody was trying to flop and they put in the rule, you know, you can get fined 5,000 bucks or whatever if you get caught with crazy flopping and it really cut down on it as well. So great call by the board of governors rules committee yeah. or whoever. And I'm glad it's already having an effect.
And Matt, you know, I, go, I look again at a guy like James Harden, for example. You know, he would average 11 free throws per game last season. You're see, he's off 7% in just what his um, percentage of shots that resulted in free throws or in fouls from just last season alone. He's not taking as many free throws. And I know Harden's a guy who gets to the basket and, and gets to the foul line, but he is probably the one guy who's notorious with those moves out on the perimeter for getting the opportunity to get fouled and get himself to the line. Yeah, and as someone who fell for his shenanigans many times when I played, I wish they had put this rule in a lot earlier. Would have saved me a lot of film session uh, <laughs> grief with Coach Pop for not, not showing my hands.